everybody. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to the two minute warning feature interview series, uh, where every week we look at the great trends uh, and challenges facing the energy transition. And uh, we're delighted, it's a pleasure today to welcome to join our Secretary General and CEO, Dr. Angela Wilkinson from the World Energy Council. Thank you very much, Dr. Angela, for joining us today. Um, Dr. Angela, I suppose I start by, by with a preface that the council has existed for decades, sort of as a sort of security of, of, of supply for its members and trying to provide balance to the energy markets for consumers and for um, the global population. Um, I'd like to start by asking you, in, we've just passed through a very challenging quarter uh, for the global economy, for the energy sector. Uh, itself, and we're still in a, a very difficult place. Um, how has the thinking around the energy transition been impacted um, in the last three to four months? Uh, and, and what's the outlook for it in the immediate for the, the remainder of the year? Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you today. And I think if I was to think about us, we're a 97 year old organization, and we have over 3,000 member organizations, all energy organizations in over, over nearly 100 countries. So one of the things I think we can do is we can place the last quarter in context for you. So before we went into crisis, of course, everybody was talking about the overcapacity, the supply, the oversupply. There was an awful lot of, of oil. There was a lot of gas globally. So and there were downward pressures on prices. So the crisis doesn't happen in a vacuum. It's come on top of these pre-existing stresses on the system. And those aren't just the, the oversupply. They're also, everybody was expecting a slowdown in the global economy. Everybody was looking at the increase again in climate change momentum. And people were also starting to talk about the social agenda again, because we mm. tend to talk about you know, sustainability issues and then immediately focus on carbon. How do we get carbon out of the system? But we have to remember, of course, that there are billions of people around the world who still need access to energy. So when we talk sustainable development in the World Energy Council, we try to look at energy security, energy affordability and access issues and environmental sustainability issues. And the COVID crisis has been an unprecedented human health crisis. And it's impacted unevenly across um, regions, across segments of society and across um, sectors of the economy. And it's also impacted unevenly in the energy system, the energy industry landscape itself. You look at the electricity companies and they're doing quite well, actually, because they have seen, although they've seen drops in daily demand for electricity, it's really been a shift from offices to homes. When you look at the oil industry, of course, it's had a massive downturn because of the drop in transport and travel. But we're still using 70 million barrels of oil a day for petrochemicals and other uses. So there's, there's huge momentum still in oil. When you look at the gas sector, there's still momentum. So the, 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 the watchword is uneven, significant mm -hmm. and still cascading. There's been, a, yeah, and there's been a lot of talk in the last month or two, and also just in parallel, we've seen a lot of economic stimulus being pumped into economy, certain economies, obviously, in the developed world by the government, a lot of money going into that to help economies get back on track. Uh, some of them are still shut down to a certain extent. There's been a lot of talk on, well, uh, there's proof there that, you know, the money can be made available for crises, if you like. And there has been criticism in the past that governments have not put enough money into energy transition policies, action, et cetera. Uh, and there's quite a bit of a momentum, a, a sort of a, a revamp momentum towards spending, towards energy transition by both the industry and by, by policy and governments. Would you agree that the, the, the whole sort of, uh, I suppose, effort towards energy transition has been given a bit of a new lease of life um, because of the last three, four months and what we've seen, or, or has it stymied, uh, if you like, investment in, in, into, that, into that direction? Well, I, I think, again, we also have to say transition from what to what. So we're talking about here, I think, global energy transition and the, the opportunity for us to be less dependent for, on fossil fuels and to shift much more to more renewable energy resources. 
And everybody's excited about that opportunity because we've seen new technologies come forward. We've seen dramatic drops in the costs of what we would call um, additional amounts of energy. So you, particularly in the part of the world, um, in the Middle East region, we've seen commercial scale solar. In other parts of the world, we're seeing commercial uh, attempts at commercial scale wind, and that's bringing down these prices, right? Bring, creating opportunities. But when we talk about fiscal stimulus, we have to talk about the money that's required to invest in the existing system as well as in building the new system. Mm -hmm. And we also have to find the money to decommission, to, 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 to lay down the old system. Now, all of these are costs to society. At the end of the day, the people who pay for energy transition are you and me. So we have to think about how do we manage those costs of moving faster, from a world that used to be dominated by fossil fuels to a world which is increasingly around new renewable energy resources. And those costs are not just about new build, but about existing um, existing and maintaining yeah. and decommissioning. I mean, you, meant, you mentioned the, afford, the whole affordability of it, and you've talked mm -hmm. about humanizing the transition, uh, right. uh, i.e. making it affordable for both industry, government, and obviously people who are on the receiving end of that energy. And so where are we at with that? Obviously, there's a lot of technology out there that is, is waiting to be deployed, you could argue. Um, uh, maybe it's not economically feasible yet. Uh, and, and the argument is, well, how quickly should it be deployed towards our sort of 2030, 2050 uh, net zero targets? So how fast should we be moving in the transition, in your opinion, and, and at the same time, keeping it affordable uh, and cost effective, as you said? as fast as we can go without leaving anyone behind would be the ultimate balancing act and to do that we have to stop thinking i think in terms of a war on carbon as though what the only thing that matters is getting down the carbon emissions or the co2 emissions as fast as possible that is important but we have to enable billions of better livelihoods and we have to enable new economic and industrial opportunities so i think People are talking about what they call green fiscal policies, you know, the kickstarting the economies. And there's a huge opportunity for countries that have an abundance already of energy. Of course, there are energy efficiency programs, there's building retrofit programs, there's all these massive investment opportunities. Mm -hmm. For countries that have no energy, they're in a very different investment position. And for countries that have some energy, but maybe not enough, I think they're they, they need to look at what I would call pathways to climate neutrality, not a war on carbon and not do nothing, but you have to find, you know, there's no one, one pathway to the future for every country or region. They're all in different situations and they all need to find ways of moving further and faster together. So, I think the hope is that we might see a more reasonable debate than the war on carbon we were seeing before this crisis. We might see more innovation and more investment in pathways to climate neutrality, which allow greater affordability to different types of society and also new industrial um, developments and better livelihood prospects. And do you see that, and, and to do that, of course, you need you know, global coordination, you need sort of top-down policy directives, uh, uh, you know, individually by countries and different parts of the world, and obviously the coordination on that. I mean, easier said than done. How hopeful are you that we can reach that balance uh, in, in terms of coordinating that and, and while recognizing that each region or country needs a, a different plan? I think we've entered a new era of cooperation um, and the question of the COVID, this current crisis is what will be the what will be the imprint on that new potential for cooperation? You know, will we see societies thinking, well, actually, we can only get through this together. So we mean, need more and better international cooperation. Or will we see societies going, we don't want anything to do with anybody else. We're going to do it on our own. So those those potentials remain. But when when we talk about a new era of cooperation, I think it's important you use the word top down policy. I think we live in a world which is much more about bottom up um, muddle through. And there's a resistance to being told what to do by other people who mm -hmm. don't know our particular situation. So I think the new, the new era of cooperation is much more about diversity, about inclusiveness, about plurality, and about having maybe common targets, but understanding that there might be different means for getting there. So it's not a world where we're waiting for a global government to come along and tell us what to do. 
It's the world where we want societies to learn with and from each other, not in reinvent the policy wheel, but recognize that policies that work are different in different parts of the world. And um, that's, I think, a new era of cooperation. And the, the hardest part of that is for governments. It requires them to join the dots between different ministries. Energy isn't just about energy, it's also about, um, about health, about education, about transport. And I was, I was in the Middle East earlier this year before all the closed lockdown. And I, I find it amazing that there are, in the, some of the governments in the Middle East are really taking this connected integrated policy challenge really very seriously. And well, that's we, what I wanted to actually ask you about the Middle East, where we are. Um, it, how, how, how successful is that coordination happening? Is it between ministries? It's a it's sort of holistic, if you like, approach to, to transition across sectors in the economy. You know, certain governments in the Middle East have been criticized for not being clear enough on policy uh, and, reg and not being, you know, not implementing regulations fast enough or consistently enough. You're saying you've been impressed in your visit here when, when you when you came. How would you compare the, the, the pace at which Gulf economies perhaps are moving towards the energy transition compared to Europe, for example, or, or the USA? Well, I think the starting points are very different. You know, you, you also have governments, of course, in the Middle East who are trying to diversify their economy. So they're not just solely dependent on their revenues from from oil and gas. But if I look at, you know, I was in Saudi, I've also been out to um, the UAE, and when I look at what they're doing around their policy frameworks, they're, they're saying, well, you know, it's not a question of learning what worked in the past, it's a question about finding what's going to make us fit for the future. That, to me, is the ultimate evolution and adaptation challenge. And they're very diff they're different approaches. I spent a long time with the Minister, His Excellency, the Minister of Energy in Saudi Arabia, meeting his young department. And it's an impressive group of people who are all working at how do they manage the development and formulation of energy policy, which contributes to economic diversification, which joins the, the, the dots between the different ministries. It's, a, it's, it's an, an impressive conversation and, and capability he's building. In the UAE last year, I was in the World Energy Congress in UAE in September, October. And I was listening there to the Minister of Energy, who was talking about their, I think it's a, something like a, an eight by eight strategy or something, which again is all about the fact that we live in a world where these challenges are connected. We can't deal with it only in policy silos, and we have to develop more agile and adaptable capabilities in policy, not just incremental improvement, but step changes. I have no idea if these governments are going to be successful. What I am, all I can say is, they are taking forward some very brave policy and courageously policy innovative experiments. So I would like to see where they go and I'd like to join them on the journey so that we all learn. And would you would you agree that, okay, that's the, looking at the government and, and sort of NOCs, if you like, from that perspective and those initiatives, where, where would you put the IOCs, the independent majors, who are obviously some of them very vocally and practically you know, taking measures to, to, to start to make this transition themselves uh, in, in, uh, and investing, obviously, in, in new energy and green energy themselves and sort of making that transition gradually. Would you say that they have moved uh, fast enough? You're, you know, you keep making the point that half the world or more than half the world doesn't even have basic energy yet. We cannot do without oil and gas. We have to cleanse it. How, how successful or ha have, have majors been in starting to make the transition themselves and, and should they be going faster? I think the major, you know, IOCs and, and SOEs are different entities. They're subject to different um, revenue pressures. They're, they, you know, one has the market demanding returns, the other have governments demanding returns. So they both have, they both have paymasters, they're just different types of paymasters. I think the IOCs have, you, you see the difference opening up between the IOC space. You see how they are, they are, some of them are declaring they're going to be the world's biggest, cleanest power companies, not, not, not even using the word oil and gas. They start using the word energy companies. So in the IOC world, I see a difference between them stopping using the word oil and gas and moving towards being energy players. And that's challenging for publics to understand because we use the word energy to cover power, we use the word energy to cover oil, we use the word energy to cover gas, but actually these are all facets of the energy system. 
And the same for the SOEs. I see some of this, these state-owned enterprises, you know, from India, from China, from the Middle East, they're making remarkable investments in research and development plays, but they're looking at very, very different regional pathways, I think, than, than we're seeing in Europe and North America, because their situations are different. I think the, the good news for all of us is that if there is increasing competition in a race for green and a race for sustainability between IOE, IOCs and SOEs, that's the best, best news in the world for the world as a whole. But we have to understand that you can't just do this by thinking about global pathways that are imposed on everybody else. You've got to do it in facilitating different regional development pathways, which recognise that regional energy systems are very different and societies need different things. Okay, I mean, you mentioned China there, obviously in India, two huge consumers. China has been producing a lot of the world's solar panels and has, has, has a monopoly on that. The, the, the hydrogen is another area where, of course, globally being now talked about and dubbed as, as the solution, if you like, i.e. decarbonizing fuel uh, and having sort of net zero emission options and solving perhaps the problem that renewables directly aren't, which is being able to also power uh, you know, heavier transport in time, not just, not just consumer transport. Where are we on that equation? We've seen a lot of money and investment uh, being talked about this in the last year or two on hydrogen. It's being touted as, as really the uh, future solution over electrification. Would you agree with that? And is the agenda being pushed at the right pace? Oh, I think, yeah, hydrogen is definitely hot. Um, when we were in the World Energy Congress last year, we were surprised by the amount of, of emphasis on hydrogen. We've been tracking it for 10 years. We've been watching what we call the hydrogen bubble growing. Mm -hmm. Definitely the interest in terms of investment on the supply side, but very little evidence yet of the demand pull for hydrogen. And this remains the issue and challenge in many different parts of the world. And I think it's important, you know, we're, we're the World Energy Council, so we're technology neutral. We're not saying hydrogen should happen. We're saying, how would it happen in the way that people talk about it? So we've got used to electrification as an energy vector. It's not a source, right? It's not like oil or gas or solar. It's a, a vector. And that means it allows you to be flexible. You can change between your supply, you can change between your use, and you can change between your storage. So electrification allows you to supply, store, and use energy in many different ways. And hydrogen's like that. That's why people are so interested in it. It's not an energy resource. Mm -hmm. It allows you to supply, use, and store energy in very di many different ways. So it's very, it's your flexible friend. And we are, I think last, last numbers I saw were about $90 billion worth of investment going into that new hydrogen play. And many different regions looking to position themselves. And I think there's a real challenge in where will we see the level playing field internationally for hydrogen developments? You know, it can't be first to the post wins. Mm -hmm. We saw that in the development of the fossil fuel uh, industry. And how do we keep space in the development of the international opportunity space for emerging economies who, who are still yet to understand that they have an opportunity space in hydrogen and will want to take it? but not to be locked out of that opportunity space if they're slightly slower than others who come Yeah, to I mean, we have, we have quite, with some European companies, I think Germany has gone quite, uh, uh, they've invested in Morocco recently in hydrogen sourcing. So you're having a lot of sort of those companies perhaps who have the technology or, or, the, or the funds starting to invest, obviously, where, where they can actually source that hydrogen. You mentioned um, Dr. Angela's storage. That has been obviously, uh, you know, still a huge challenge in terms of battery storage and trying to sort of grow that market, if you like, to, to and sort of solving the intermittency problem of, of, of that. Um, do you see that being resolved in the future or, or being sort of faded out in, 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 in favor of, with other things coming into favor, such as hydrogen? Is hydrogen going to provide less of a challenge in that case? You said we haven't actually got there yet. Um, is, is, does that, is that an advantage that hydrogen holds over battery power, for example? I don't think there's a, I don't think there's, I don't think there's only two horses in the race, but if there were two horses, they would be breeds rather than individuals. So I think there are, 
there are electrical storage um, pathways and there are molecular storage mm -hmm. pathways. We tend to call it one, 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 we tend to call batteries, but it's actually not just battery technology. And the other one we tend to call hydrogen, right? Because one's about molecules, the other's about electrons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's clear is that hydrogen uh, storage is going to become a bigger challenge, right? not just in terms of the intermittency of renewables. So the sun doesn't shine at night. You need to have some energy. The wind doesn't always blow. You need to have something so that you can call storage forward. But you don't just need daily storage or minute by minute storage or even second by second storage. You also need seasonal and long term storage. And hydrogen seems to have some advantages over electrons in that it's cheaper to transport across long distances and you can store it seasonally in a different way than if you had to try and do long store long term mm -hmm. storage in batteries and there's a lot of interest in battery innovation still i don't want to i don't want to to say that's not going on the challenge with batteries ultimately is going to be the materiality of the batteries you get you need a lot of resources to, to produce batteries and so you also need a recycling industry for yeah, that was it that, that's been the, that's been the big sort of question mark of well as that grows uh, as as a source um, the recycling is a challenge uh, in terms of doing that in a clean way. But I think, you know, we are, we are curious and creative human beings. We love these challenges. I think the important piece is innovation is part of energy transition and so is cooperation. And what's coming forward, we would say, is it's not just innovation in the old way. There's new combinations of innovation, policies, behaviours and technologies of many different types. We're saying cooperation is going to be different. It's not just going to be states and um, businesses. It's also going to be communities and cities. And underneath all of this, we're saying that we've entered a new era of humanizing energy transition, because at the end of the day, those impacted by energy transition and the workforce also need to be engaged in the conversations about which of these solutions and pathways enable us not just to have security and resilience, but also affordability and access, as well as environmental sustainability. And are we seeing, we, we touch on this point in, in, in quite a few of our of the themes that we deal with at our forums and our interviews, the talents and skill sets that are needed you know, to go towards this cooperation, this, this innovation, et cetera, R&D. Again, I mean, the, 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 the oil and gas industry, the traditional energy industry has had its cycles and uh, you know, it has always been uh, criticized perhaps for not being forward thinking enough, not attracting that sort of new innovative talent that, that is coming forth. Does the transition, uh, is it facing the same uh, challenge, if you like, or are all these new industries now, no problem, we're attracting all these bright new graduates to, to join our industry instead of going over to pure technology industries, let's say. Are we having, is that, is that sort of transitioning itself as well? I think as the energy transition plays out, the industry, the industry isn't seen as this old, dirty, pioneer, you know, red, um, oil-necked offshore culture anymore. I think it's becoming much more exciting and the skill set is expanding. We've got digitalization energy. You have mm -hmm. finance and energy. So it's not like you have all other sectors within energy. If you're interested in managing people, energy is a great career choice. If you're interested in the environment, energy is a great career choice. If you like finance and quant, it's a great choice it's no longer about oily rags and and um, drilling on a rig the energy system is becoming much broader more diverse more dynamic and the skill sets that are required are as much um, they're as much human as they are technical and they're as much financial as they are engineering and I think that you see a lot more women coming into energy because it's much more of a it's much more of a reflection of all of the challenges facing society than just uh, an engineer, an old fashioned engineering mm -hmm. culture. So I think the, the challenge will always be, you know, economics dictates a lot in the world, who pays what? But if you look at what we've been through since the great financial crisis, we're now in the middle of this human health crisis, both of those affect energy transition. And if we want to avoid a next energy crisis, we're going to need a much more diverse set of skills within the energy sector. And I think it's going to become a much more attractive and interesting and exciting place for young people to want to put their skills and talents because energy really matters. I can't think of a, 
a, of a, a sector to work in that doesn't really transform every other part of life for everybody anywhere. So I'm, I've always been very passionate about energy. I've always found a whole universe of possibilities in the world of energy. And I think there's a whole generation of men and women who are coming up who will see energy as their future. Okay, and I mean, just and just sort of looping back to the immediate, if you like, and today, uh, and, and just ha looking, having an outlook for the next six months, if you like, where we are where we are, we've seen, uh, obviously, uh, a huge drop in demand in the last three months, uncertainty going forward. We've had a recovery in the oil price in the last month or so, um, some resurgence in demand in certain economies, sporadic. But again, this everyone's sort of worried about the second wave that all somewhere between the first and second wave of, of, of COVID sort of resurging as economies open up. Um, but we have seen demand come back. And would you say there's, there's a risk that, well, if we suddenly see a surge in demand, if you like, uh, you know, for the next three, four months, that again, the focus will all turn to, 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 to that. And, and, you know, whether it's China having to burn more coal or, or having to, you know, having oil obviously being, being in demand much more, is that going to take any attention away from the, 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 sort of the attention that we got on climate change in the last three, four months, and this is the resurgence of interest of investing in that. Um, do you think the immediate problems will, will again take away that focus? I think if, we, if we're humanizing energy transition, which we have to do if we really want to exit crisis successfully, then you're actually having to join up the conversation between how do we address both the climate change challenge and the human development challenge. You can't separate those out in, in different parts of the world. And, and I think we will see, I hope we will see more and better quality leadership dialogue around the need for pathways that enable us not just to think about how do we, how do we reduce carbon dioxide emissions, but how do we also recycle or reuse carbon? How do we find new opportunities for, for human development that don't destroy the planet, but also provide better livelihoods for many more people? And there is no doubt in our, in our long-term energy scenarios, we say there'll be a doubling of energy demand by 2040, a tripling of the, the requirement for electrification, right? So these are, this is what I call the demand tsunami, right? Mm -hmm. But there's a huge wave of demand coming towards the world. As we exit from crisis, we can't just think about how do we save energy in the countries where we're using a lot of it, because many countries don't have enough energy to save. So we have to supply and provide energy to people that's useful and affordable to them. And that's going to, they, their uses are changing. People want mobile energy. They don't want it fixed, they want it mobile. They, want, they love electricity because they're used to using it, but they still want to travel. So they need um, clean uh, fuels as well. So I think I'm, I am more hopeful that we won't have an idea that there's black and white solutions, that there's one fix that's right for everybody. I hope we will have a much better opportunity to think about exit is going to be really hard. To do it, we're going to have to be more open around the solution spaces that we have available and what we use. And from our perspective in the World Energy Council, we don't think it's possible to predict what's going to happen in the next six months but that energy leaders will be able to work with a set of alternative energy futures and navigate as they go. So it's not about making the right investment now. We're going to have to make investment now and think about the flexibility of that investment going forward in order to keep adapting to the situation as it unfolds. Okay, well, that, and, and, and just not to end, that, that's all very positive, but I wanted to just, before we finish, to mention leadership. Uh, and, and obviously we have a lot of very powerful leaders <laughs> leading consuming and producing countries these days we've had a breakdown if you like in, in certain relationships in the last few months we've got the donald trump uh, presidency that has changed the u.s relationship with a lot of countries uh china obviously being one of them europe etc again how uh, you've got you know russia with its own dynamics we have uh, you've got a change in political dynamics that we've seen in the last year or two uh, and those have perhaps been accentuated as as we face this COVID crisis and different points of view of how to manage that uh, by countries do you do you how confident are you or how important uh, are those individuals and leaders to 
towards the, this, this purpose that you've just outlined in terms of the flexibility of, of what we need to look at and looking at investments uh, across the board. Uh, do you feel that that, that, that is perhaps stymieing um, the, the purpose, if you like, the Energy Council and, and, and perhaps the majority of countries who want to move forward on that front? I have heard some people say, well, we don't live in a global world anymore, so there's no need for a worldwide energy community like the World Energy Council anymore. Well, you might not think you live in a global world, but we're all connected. And whether, you, whether your politics are for open and, um, and uh, cooperative relationships internationally is a choice, but the world is globally connected right climate isn't a local problem whatever one country does affects other countries the same with water the same with food and the same with energy and clearly the geopolitics of energy still matters right i also hear people saying well in renewables it's only about market prices now well that's true to a certain extent in terms of marginal costs but not in terms of whole system transition mm -hmm. right Geopolitics still matters. Even before the crisis, geopolitics was broadening in energy beyond oil and gas. And oil and gas are increasingly decoupled. You're seeing changes in, they're no longer just, the oil price doesn't sit, set the gas price anymore. That's what we mean by decoupled. But also because technology is coming in, the geopolitics of technology, we've seen that in the COVID crisis in two ways. Yes, we've seen some countries going, it's my medical technology. But we've also seen a huge degree of international cooperation in medical sciences towards a vaccine. So I, I think it's too early to say that we are moving into a world which has no international cooperation or hasn't got an idea about um, globalization. I, but I do think we're moving into a world where people understand that you have to have regionalism and globalization. You don't have one without the other. It's a two wheeled bicycle and they are synergies between them. And that it's not you can't you can't decide to opt out of a globally interconnected world and hope mm -hmm. to be um, be prosperous and and um, progressive. So I you know the, the politics is one thing, the realities are something else, and I think we have the potential for cooperation, which is as much bottom up and horizontal as it is top down. And I think that's the new era of cooperation. And I see cities and um, states and companies and communities taking the opportunities to think about how they are globally interconnected and interdependent and not just waiting for their governments but pushing their governments towards cooperation. Well we're certainly seeing a, a lot of that on the street at the moment. Dr Angela Wilkinson thank you very much uh, for joining us uh, and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you very much. A pleasure, thank you.